It is uh, a great honor to introduce to you the man I call my boss, John Taft. Thank you very much, Dick. And I have had the fortune to accomplish just about everything I'd hoped to accomplish in my career in the financial services industry. And the one thing I'd like to do before I retire is I would like to work for Dick Sorensen. He has that everything's going to be okay, paternal, uh, supportive, boss feel to him, doesn't he? And uh, he runs a great business. Uh, the local market head for RBC Wealth Management should be known to many of you is also here. I'd ask him to stand up. Please, Brad Fisher, who's the director of our branch here in the Tri-Cities. <clears throat> well, what I'm going to talk to you about today is really some pretty hardcore economic outlook and market prognostication stuff. A lot of the information has been put together in a document that's at your seats. And I would tell you that for us who work at the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, this is a really exciting work product. For the first time, we are now pulling together um, market specialists and economists who live and work all around the world. RBC has a presence. It's uh, one of the largest top 10 financial institutions in the world. It's arguably the best managed, best capitalized, uh, certainly the largest finan uh, financial institution in the Canadian banking system, which is the safest and soundest Canadian uh, uh, banking system in the world, and which weathered the financial crisis almost without missing a beat. A lot of lessons to be learned from uh, the Canadian banking system, a lot of lessons to be learned from the way RBC is managed. And this document is really a um, compilation of the views and insights of all of the market experts we have working around the globe. When I talk about what's going on with small and emerging businesses in China, I didn't go to China to check that out. That's what somebody at RBC uh, is living every day. So what I'm going to do is walk you through today what is really our global outlook for 2012. And it's a, on the one hand, on the other hand story. I think on balance, our outlook is more positive than it is negative, but hopefully it will identify some factors for you to uh, think about uh, as, as you think about uh, what to do in your businesses or what you think or what to do in your personal, managing your personal financial wealth. And of course, uh, prognosticating in the financial services industry is always dangerous. We can look at, um, we can look at what happened here with four candidates for the um, wall of shame. In August of, of 1979, Business Week famously trumpeted the death of equities. And making a claim like that you know, doesn't give you much upside if you're right, and it has lots of upside when you're wrong. But it, this wasn't that big a deal. Didn't seem like that risky a prognostication when they made it because the market had been trading in a range for years and had seen a couple of bear markets. And this was, I think a lot of people would have agreed with this statement. Well, they looked like they were going to be right for a while. But five years later, equities had increased in value by 60%. Ten years later, equities had increased in value by 236%. And 20 years down the road, 1,200% increase in the value of equities from the date that prediction was made. So obviously, to paraphrase Mark Quain, reports of the death of equities were a little premature and greatly exaggerated. So you fast forward 20 years, and this time it was the economist's turn to lay it on the line. So they came out with a headline, Drowning in Oil. And in light of the fact that oil was in a near decade-long bear market, uh, that also didn't seem like such a, such a, uh, a um, risky prediction. But the only thing we were drowning in five years later were the high prices of oil, not oil itself. Not to be done, Time Magazine took its own swing at infamy in 2005, cover that uh, adapted one of the phrases, and it was almost like a contra harbinger of things to come. Home sweet home, housing had been such a good investment for so long 
that many, including time, convinced themselves housing prices will not, would never go down. So you can fast forward now six years, and we've been down almost 30 percent decline nationally in housing prices, and now people are having trouble convincing themselves that housing prices will ever go up. Well, the latest entry in this uh, category arrived in November with, with the November 26 issue of The Economist. Asked the question, is this really the end? And the caption was below a graphic that showed a, 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 a picture of the euro hurtling towards uh, some black end. So this is, this is the question we're looking to answer right now. Is this really the end? Um, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, rather, you know, is you know, rather than trying to give you strong predictions, I'm going to identify a number of macro trends. The piece in front of you talks about three elephants in the room. I'm going to talk about each of those and hopefully uh, some other, uh, give you some insights into that, some of our thinking around those trends, and then talk about a couple of other factors that will be important to the economy and to financial markets this, this year. So I'm going to cover three issues that have implications for the 2012 markets, slow economic growth in the U.S., an apparent recession in Europe and an extending, extended and very challenging period of adjustment in the Chinese economy. I'm also going to talk about uh, oil and uh, the upcoming U.S. presidential election. So let's flip to the three elephants in the room. The U.S. economy is forecast to grow by roughly 2% this coming year. And that's an uncomfortably slow rate of growth. In economic terms, you've probably heard the expression stall speed, an airplane that's going at the speed where it's it could stall or not. That's what 2% growth uh, looks like or it represents because it will leave us flirting all year long with the possibility of recession. We think at RBC the U.S. will avoid a recession in 2012. And um, I would have to say that probably back in September, November period of time, people's assessment of what that risk was was somewhat higher than it is today, a little bit more sanguine outlook today. Now, the distinction between a recession and a no recession scenario is a really important one from an earnings standpoint. Even in a slow growth, uh, slow GDP growth environment, it would be, uh, that would be enough to deliver reasonable restrained but reasonable profits, corporate profits growth in 2012. But it's important to remember, while the U.S. is forecasted to grow at 2 percent, that Europe contributes about 15 percent to the earnings of S&P 500 companies. And it appears that Europe is in a recession. So smaller profits from the continent, possibly further aggregated by translation effects of a weaker euro, could mean earnings growth from domestic sources would have to make up the difference between what, uh, w with what's going on in Europe, and that's a lot to ask out of the domestic economy. A recession is a totally different matter when it comes to earnings. S&P 500 earnings typically decline 20 to 25 percent in recessions, and since July, the market's been adjusting to the prospect of slower earnings growth. At its worst moment this fall, our uh, stock market was pricing at about a 50 percent probability of a recession. We're better than that now as far as the market outlook. That's why the market has been doing well recently. And if there is a recession in the offering, if, offering, if we do have a recession, then we're going to look at some backsliding in the market from where we, where we are today. But uh, uh, importantly, note that we, that's not what we think will happen. We do not think we're going to experience a recession in the U.S. in 2012. Europe, however, is a different story. Europe is already in a recession. The sovereign debt crisis, deteriorating business conditions, consumer confidence is in the can, and there's an increasingly dysfunctional banking system. Those are the culprits. Now, something has to happen to resolve the sovereign debt crisis. If that does, it would permit the economy to pull it back, itself back into positive growth. But I'll tell you what, nothing we've seen so far over in Europe gives us any, any uh, confidence that that's going to happen. On the other hand, if things in Europe were to deteriorate, if the temporary solutions that have been put into place morph into something worse, then we're going to see 
a much deeper economic downturn. And just as was the case in the U.S., a recession in Europe means earnings don't merely slow down, they decline, often significantly. Since peaking in the spring, many European in equity indexes have corrected by about 10% more than their counterparts elsewhere in the world. Most of the damage was attributable to banks and the rest to prospects for a mild and short-term economic downturn. So what the market has not priced in, from our perspective, is a longer, deeper downturn and the banking crisis, which remains unresolved, is probably the biggest wild card in, to, in whether we do that or not. The Chinese economy right now, as I said earlier, is in an extended period of adjustment. It's becoming more painful and problematic as time unfolds. Very tight monetary conditions designed to bring down inflation and rein in a uh, uh, incipient property bubble are working. They are uh, cooling the economy off, but there is a uh, simultaneous credit crunch and it's having an effect on the ability of small to medium-sized manufacturers to finance their business. They're already failing cha uh, facing challenges from a failing demand in Europe, which is their bigger customer, and a weaker order book in the U.S. And clearly there's room in China for the picture to get worse rather than better. And while there's plenty of growth levers left for uh, Chinese policymakers to pull, and while we're forecasting a soft landing for China, the slowdown has already gone on longer than most of us were expecting six months ago, and it's uh, producing knock-on effects throughout Asia, especially for commodity producers. China's begun to ease monetary conditions, but it'll be a while before there's enough easing in place to turn around the slowdown in their economy that's already uh, underway. So there's a theme running through our outlook that captures the dilemma facing anyone who's in business or investing uh, the investing business. And that is that valuations today, when we look at them, are pretty attractive, pretty compelling. And that's if our forecast is realized. But slow growth in the U.S., a short, mild reception, uh, recession in Europe, and a soft landing in China are by no means assured. And if we fail to hit any one of those predictions, if we miss to the downside in any one of those three areas, then there's considerable room for the market to decline from where it is today. So let's look a little more at each of these three concerns. Slow economic growth in the United States, remember I said about 2% is what we forecast this year, is inextricably tied to the housing market. Most of you are painfully aware the housing slump is now in the sixth year. The medium home price peaked in July of 2006 at about $230,000 and it's now $168,000. That's down 28%. And this represents an almost, well it is, an unprecedented destruction of wealth because millions of people lost uh, equity value in their homes or lost their homes outright and um, banks are continuing to deal with waves and waves of mortgage foreclosures and defaults. Making matters worse, housing, especially new home construction, is a key driver not only of U.S. GDP growth but also of job creation because each new home that's built adds roughly three jobs to the economy. The price data in the slide here to your left uh, paints a pretty dire picture of what the housing market has been through already, and it seems to offer you know, precious little encouragement that any significant revival is imminent. However, home prices don't tell the whole story. You have to look at all the data, supply, demand, and try to put together a picture of what's coming down the pike. There are, in fact, signs of life on the supply side of the equation inventories on the slide on the right have come down for their highs. There's an old adage in investing that a market has to trade before it can trade higher and there are actually signs in the housing market that the housing market is starting to trade. But inventory levels you can see are still really high and out, without some significant demand uh, it's years away from uh, approaching normalcy. Now, demands come back <clears throat> from extremely depressed levels of a couple of years ago. Affordability is much better today than it was at the low point several years ago. 
And you could see a conventional demand recovery take place in the U.S. housing market. There's unconventional demand right now for housing. It comes in the form of investment in houses, foreign buyers, corporate buyers. That's starting to become a larger factor, but it's not big enough to drive this market. We really have to come back to the fundamentals before that happens. Uh, supply has declined by about a million homes over the last several years, and demand's recovered by just about as much. So um, even though the shadow inventory is high and we're a long way from, from a normal market, there are signs of hope here, and we need those signs to materialize if we want the U.S. to maintain what we think will be a 2% growth, growth rate and stay out of recession. Now moving to Europe. Low business, uh, Europe is a mess. As, I mean, I don't know how many of you have been over there who do business in Europe, but it is a complete and utter mess right now. There's low business and consumer confidence. There's a troubled banking system. The sovereign debt crisis is playing a major role in what's going on over there, and that itself is the key to resolving uh, what's, what the problems they have in turning the economy around. Borrowing costs for many of the EU countries are a major concern. As a group, the 17 countries in the Eurozone need to issue substantial debt this year, the equivalent of about $600 billion. Sovereign bond yields for the country of Italy began the year at 7% for 10-year notes, meaning the country is paying just an outlandish premium to finance its deficits. And uh, the high interest rates are persisting. Uh, uh, they, they were uh, basically in evidence uh, in, when Italy issued $15 billion in a recent bond auction. Spain uh, is also in a difficult predicament. Their bond yields are over 5 percent. France, uh, you just read in France that France was a bunch of, uh, among a bunch of countries that was downgraded by Standard & Poor's. They lost their AAA rating, even as the U.S. lost its AAA rating last year. And they were forced to issue bonds at substantially higher yields recently. Greece hasn't disappeared from the radar screen. Despite numerous bailouts, a change in their government, a tentative agreement for yet another bailout, it's un ultimately unclear whether the country will satisfy European leaders' fiscal requirements and whether they'll be able to remain in the euro currency bloc. While Eurozone nations are slowly but surely moving towards tighter fiscal union, the announcements you've been reading about are really uh, full of holes. They're largely voluntary, and they have just incredible implementation risks. Despite all of that, however, progress is being made in Europe. The European Central Bank has put together a new three-year liquidity and lending program. That's bought the bank some time to restructure. And even though the ECB has repeatedly and adamantly stated that it won't print euros to bail out sovereign nations or banks directly, what they are doing really equates to a backdoor version of what the Fed did with their quantitative one and quantitative two easing programs. And they've actually expanded the European Central Bank's balance sheet faster than the Fed did in the wake of the financial crisis. So our European analysts believe that the uh, ECB program has averted a catastrophe within the Eurozone banking system, which could have brought down the global financial system even more dramatically than the housing crisis could have in the United States. However, it's not a long-term solution. There's a lot more work to be done, and if it doesn't get fixed in a long-term way, we're going to continue to have risks and problems in Europe. China, does it hold all the keys? Not all the keys, but it holds a lot of the keys. As I remember, as I mentioned, they're the third area to watch. Um, you all know about their growing importance in the global marketplace. They're an export-driven economy. They're no, by no means immune to the slowdown in growth that's going along, uh, uh, that's happening throughout the world in the Europe and in the UK. And um, China is still in a positive, uh, export position, but their, their exports are, are uh, slowing dramatically. They're also feeling the pinch from, as I said earlier, tight domestic monetary policy. And their manufacturing indexes are falling for the first time since 2009. And yet, if you ask most people what's going to happen in China, they still expect double-digit growth. 
There's a lot that's going on there, just a lot of powerful fundamental sources I won't, uh, of growth. I won't go through all of them. The key thing that policymakers there are trying to do is to avoid rampant inflation and avoid a property bubble. So you're going to see a lot of uh, fine-tuning foot on, foot off the gas pedal in China, trying to maintain growth without spiking inflation. The good news is inflation seems to be um, uh, tame right now taming, improving, so that may give policymakers more room to focus on growth going forward. Oil, critical driver of global economic growth, um, <clears throat> slow U.S. growth, recession in Europe, Chinese problematic growth, uh, that's going to have an effect on, on oil prices. They've been on an upward trend for the past decade as producers are reaching for higher cost sources of supply and emerging economies are driving demand. And within this secular rising trend in oil prices, volatility is the name of the game. Uh, we think tight supply conditions are going to stay in place in 2012, but Libyan production, which is very meaningful, just came back on board. Uh, growth in the emerging, uh, emerging economies is going to keep demand for oil high, uh, high. So there are a lot of a lot of things that argue for continued high oil prices, but only twice in history has oil held prices over $100 a barrel. So there is some resistance to higher oil prices. Given that Europe looks to be in a recession, Chinese growth is expected to slow, and the U.S. is just muddling along. Um, if oil does anything, it could supply on the downside. Prices could go lower than many people expect. Then there's the presidential election. Okay, this is where you get into, you know, uh, funky stuff here. So you get all these people who go back and talk about what happened. Uh, what are we looking at? It's an election year. Okay, it's the fourth year, not the eighth year, of the current president's term of service. That's usually a very good year for stocks. We're going to either reelect a Democrat or we're going to newly elect a Republican. So guess what? There are statistics that tell you what happens in either one of those cases. If you re-elect a Democrat, stocks go up 14.5 percent historically in election years. If you newly elect a Republican, stocks go up 18.8 percent. Still a whole lot better in both cases than what we have been experiencing the last several years. And if 2012 were a normal presidential election, the S&P 500, we could expect it to rise in seven of the 12 months this coming year. And every four quarter, every one of the four quarters of 2012 would have a positive return. That's the record of election year. But what's different this time, you always have to ask yourself, and that is rarely have we gone into election year with a kind of gridlock and policy disputes that we're experiencing right now. So it's not at all clear that the past will uh, drive uh, 2012 election year market uh, performance. But in general, uh, but for that fact, uh, you, should, you should think about at least having some exposure to the equity markets in this election year. So as you can see, 2012 will be another challenging year for the U.S. and global economies, but we'll have lots of opportunities for investors. Many economists are predicting that the U.S. could struggle for years due to lingering fallout from the global financial crisis and from what really is an ongoing going deleveraging of personal households and the economy. But who knows whether those predictions are going to be accurate. There's a case to be made that if U.S. growth, um, that U.S. growth could pick up later this year and going into 2012 if history repeats itself. Consider that while it normally takes nine years on average for countries to fully recover from a financial stock as severe as the one we had in 2008 and 2009, the latter stage of the recovery cycle, once you get through that, has been very strong. Other countries that have suffered through challenging and deep recessions have also experienced strong growth toward the back end of their recovery cycles. On average, countries grew at 4.4 percent for four years at the end of their recovery cycle. That contrasts to the 2 percent GDP growth we're predicting for 2012 in the U.S. 
So such a robust recovery might seem implausible today if you consider all the challenges facing, but you know, history suggests that it most definitely is a possibility. Have to end with one more thing, and that's a disclaimer that says none of this is meant to be used by you for any useful purpose. <laughs>